Hello and welcome to today's webinar featuring Connie Kasari. I'm Claire Cameron, Engagement Editor at Spectrum, the home for autism research news and analysis. We'll begin today's discussion in a moment, but first, know that we'll be fielding questions at the end of today's presentation, but you can ask them at any point during the session. To ask a question, submit them via the chat window on your screen. And as always, I'll note that if there are any members of the press tuning in, you can only report information presented during this webinar if that material has already been published elsewhere or if you have first obtained express written permission from the presenter. Connie Kassari joins us today from Los Angeles, California, where she is a professor in the Department of Education and Psychiatry at the University of California, Los Angeles. She completed her BS at Oregon State University before an AME at Peabody College in Nashville and finally her PhD at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Prior to joining the faculty at UCLA in 1990, Kasari was a postdoctoral fellow at the Neuropsychiatric Institute at the university. Kasari's research focuses on the social and communicative abilities of children with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Kasari is a founding member of the Center for Autism Research and Treatment at UCLA. She also sits on the Treatment Advisory Board of the Autism Speaks Foundation. Kasari is known for developing Jasper, which is a treatment approach designed to target the foundations of social communication. Welcome, Professor Kasari. Thank you, Claire. Um, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to talk today about um, evaluating efficacy of autism interventions. Kind of a broad topic, but I'm going to really focus in on um, three issues. So the first one is um, just talking a little bit about what we currently know about interventions, and I'm going to focus mostly on early interventions. Talk a little bit about what's been happening over the last decade in terms of improved designs and then talk a little bit about the future, which I hope will be personalizing interventions. So the problem we have is that autism is a complex disorder, and individual abilities can range from highly gifted to severely impaired. And there are lots of interventions designed specifically for children with ASD. But there's a lot of heterogeneity in response to these interventions. So we know that, not a, that a single treatment isn't effective for all interventions or all in individuals. So what's our current understanding of the efficacy of early interventions? So first, we know that we can improve cognitive outcomes, so developmental quotients, um, in young children with comprehensive many hour per week interventions. So we're talking about like 20 hours plus per week of intervention over per long periods of time two years. There have only been two randomized controlled trials that have been published on these comprehensive interventions. The first one by my colleague Tris Smith was published in 2000. And in this case, um, children were compared between about 20 hours a week of, of uh, a particular intervention compared to about 10 hours, so really comparing dose. And in this um, study, it, the focus was on discrete trial training, a particular form of applied behavior analysis. Um, you know, 10 years later, we had another study that um, involved a little bit more of a developmental approach in with the ABA, the Early Start Denver model, and that was with younger kids, so toddlers. Again, um, we have about 25 hours uh, per week versus a business as usual control group. And in both of these um, cases, we have uh, pretty significant um, results in that both of them have about 16 to 19, uh, or about 16, 15 point difference between the experimental group and the control group, suggesting that we can really make a difference in terms of those cognitive outcomes. But the studies are fairly small. Um, because, in part, because they're so intense to do. So 28 kids in the Smith study and 48 in the Dawson study. So one of the issues that we have in any intervention study is whether or not we have a lot of confidence in those results. And reproducibility of findings is a huge problem in science generally. The original studies, if they're based on small samples, often don't replicate. 
So in this case, our replications of the DTT original Smith study, which was found at the 0.05 level, did not replicate. So, but the study that followed was even smaller, so 24 children. Um, kids made gains in both groups, but there, we didn't replicate the main effect. And the same was true with the ESDM uh, original study, which again was at the 0.05 level, and the replication was about twice as many um, kids that was presented in 2014 also did not show the same main effect. That doesn't mean that the interventions aren't um, effective or aren't working or aren't good for some kids over other kids. But just in general, we'll ha we're having trouble with these replications. So what do we make of those particular findings? I think there are two issues to think about. One is your outcome measure that you're relying on. And the other one is thinking about what are those active ingredients or what is the mechanism for why the intervention might be providing some benefits. So in terms of outcome measures, we've relied a lot on IQ, and it's definitely important. Everyone wants a higher IQ rather than a lower IQ. But it's not a core deficit of kids with ASD. In fact, we know that the majority of kids 60, maybe even more, are functioning in that sort of typical range of intellectual abilities. So even if children test fairly low on IQ or DQ when they're preschoolers, they make a lot of gains over that period of time, uh, regardless of what kinds of interventions they're in. We may get more effects for core impairments um, in terms of these interventions, but they're not always tested. So, for example, social communication or restricted and repetitive behaviors are the two main core impairment areas for children with ASD. When we think about the active ingredients of intervention, we want to know, well, what's causing this intervention to work or what's the mechanism? And oftentimes, we're looking at some sort of broad stroke um, issues. For example, we look at dose. So is it 20 hours versus 10 hours or 40 hours versus 10 hours? Um, is it the teaching approach? Is it that we do discrete trial training or that we do ESDM or we do some other kind of method? Um, and we less often will look at what the content is. So what is it that we're actu actually teaching and particularly in terms of addressing some of the core areas of impairment? Another area that hasn't been tested as much um, as well is who's the agent of change. Is it the parent? Is it the uh, therapist? Does the therapist need to be a BCBA therapist? And so on. Um, we know we have lots of different studies that concentrate on, on one or, um, or more of those agents of change. Okay. So, that's kind of what we know um, about these comprehensive early interventions at this point. But methods are important. So one of the issues we have is that there's no standard of care for ASD interventions. In other words, we don't have an exact dose. We don't know exactly what we need to do um, that should be standard across the board for all children. The common control group in a randomized trial is a business as usual, like what can you get in the community um, and then I will uh, apply my experimental interve intervention to a randomized group of folks who are just getting what they can get in the community. But as you know, that varies widely across the United States and actually across the world. Um, and so, again, we don't have this kind of uh, control for what should be standard care. Um, the other way to, to do um, a control group is to have a waitlist control. And uh, people like this, especially um, folks in schools, because then everybody gets the intervention. You might have to wait a little while, but you will eventually um, get the intervention. So those are common interventions or intervention approaches, but they tend to be weaker designs than um, actually comparing two viable interventions. So there have been more of these comparative efficacy interventions of late. So for example, especially with parent-mediated interventions, 
um, you might give all of the information to the parent but not do hands-on coaching, or you might do uh, hands-on coaching with the information. And obviously, if we can just provide information to families and they can take that information and apply it to their, their child, it's much more cost-effective. There have been uh, a number of these comparative efficacy studies, mostly with parent-mediated, and two examples are here. Um, we've done a couple of these. One of, uh, one of them, published um, in pediatrics in 2014, was across five sites. Um, in the country, and what we found was that we needed to coach parents to get the change in our outcome measure, which was whether or not the child was jointly engaged with another person, that the child initiated that engagement. Um, and that if we just gave parents the information, we just didn't get the result. And similarly, um, in the CERTS method, uh, Amy Weatherby also looked at uh, parent information versus parent coaching and found that the coaching really made a difference in terms of the child's use of social communication uh, behaviors. Another sort of advancement in the last decade has been an increasing focus on implementation design. So we're much more concerned with getting these interventions out into the community. We're concerned about how they're implemented. Um, how folks are taking the information and actually doing the intervention as it was intended. But there's a, a, a type of implementation called a hybrid implementation design in which we're also concerned about the outcomes with children. So because of these issues in reproducibility, it's important to know that what we're doing in terms of implementation are still having that intended effect on the children themselves. And we've done a couple of these deployment models in our lab, uh, led by Stephanie Shire and Yachi Chang. One was in New York, one was in Los Angeles. They were both a little bit different, but using um, a social communication intervention that we developed called JASPER, which stands for Joint Attention, Symbolic Play, uh, Engagement, and Regulation. And we taught teachers how to uh, implement this with their children. So in the New York model, it was with paraprofessionals who were one-on-one -on -one with a toddler. And in New York, it was with teachers who were working in small groups with their students. So again, trying to think about how you would implement this in different contexts. And as an example of these outcomes, we found um, that the difference in children who got the JASPER intervention in a waitlist control group, randomized control, um, was that those, um, those children actually had more joint engagement at the end of intervention than the children who were waiting to get the intervention. And similarly, they also showed us more language, um, verbal, you know, spoken language, than children in the waitlist group. So getting nice effects of just teaching the paraprofessionals how to implement um, the intervention. All right. So that's all well and good. Um, but I think as we start to think about, uh, you know, the future of interventions, we can start to think about the heterogeneity and the fact that um, kids are really different in how they respond to these interventions, and that likely what kids really need is more of a sequence of treatment or some combination of different methods, right? Because researchers and clinicians, everyone recognizes that there's a lot of heterogeneity in response to any one treatment. So what works for one child may not work for another. What works now for a child may not work later. So given that situation, when and how do we make decisions about what to change in an intervention? We need to think about these methodologies that can personalize or tailor interventions and to think about how you might sequence an intervention based on the child's response. So oftentimes what we think about in clinical practice, you try one thing, it doesn't work, you try something else but it's very hard to replicate what a clinician does in practice 
if we don't study that sort of thinking, that clinical judgment and that sequencing. So we've concentrated on a group of kids that we probably know the least about, and these are minimally verbal children with autism. So we know that about 25 to 30 percent of children with autism will remain minimally verbal by school age. But we also know that the best social outcomes for these children um, is that they can talk, that they can use some sort of communication system by school age. It's a relatively um, unstudied population, oftentimes because we exclude these children from research studies because either they have lower IQ, they're difficult to test, or they can't do the kinds of interventions that we might be applying. So a few years ago, we um, had a, a workshop at uh, NIH and we were trying to figure out who these children were. And at that time, we called them nonverbal children. Well, what we found was it was really clear that most of them were not nonverbal, but that they did not use language very much. Um, we define this group oftentimes by the number of functional words spoken. So we know that some kids can speak, but they rarely do, or they do it only in some context. So, you know, you have the child who never talks at school, but clearly talks at home. Um, and there's, um, there have been a few review papers um, in this um, area where the window might be quite small um, for learning to use spoken language. And the belief um, at the time of this workshop was between about five to seven years. It's not that people cannot continue to learn to use language, but the best window once you're past age five is in this small window. Um, and then in terms of what do we do with children who just are not making progress in spoken language, well, oftentimes our treatments are just to do more of the same. We don't have a lot of, of options available, or we do less treatment. In other words, we blame the child for not making progress, and we pull back with, um, you know, the services that we could offer. So the choice has always, um, the, or the choice should be in intervention studies, do we do more of the same or do we do something different? So we had a question of um, whether or not children could learn to speak over the age of five. And when I say speak, I'm talking really about spoken language. And there was controversy at the time of the study um, using an augmentative and alternative communication device. So this is a device that produces speech for the child. Um, we started off using Dynavoxes, but of course now the iPad with um, speech generating software is very uh, common, or, or tablet that does this. Um, but there are a lot of people, both therapists and parents, who believe that if you give the child some device that talks for them, that the child actually will not learn to speak. So it was a reasonable question to ask of whether we could design a study to test this. So we um, did a study design with um, really testing sequences of interventions. And we focused in on minimally verbal five to eight-year-old children. These are children that we defined as having fewer than 20 functional words. Now most of the children, even if they had 20 words, rarely um, spoke, so they may have been heard to say these words, but we're not commonly using them every day. We decided to give all children a, a different intervention from what they had already had. So um, we gave them um, JASPER, the uh, social communication intervention we developed, along with a very structured language intervention, spoken language intervention, called enhanced milieu uh, treatment. And our main contrast here was whether or not we gave the child also an augmentative device in the context of that behavioral intervention or not. Then, um, and I should say that all of these children had had two years of early intervention prior to starting the study, and most of them had had uh, pretty comprehensive ABA-based programs. So the main outcome for us was whether or not we could increase socially communicative language from an independent language sample. So our contrast was whether we gave them the behavioral treatment alone or whether we gave them the behavioral treatment with the augmentative device. 
and our objectives were to construct and uh, systematically test an adaptive intervention that addresses um, socially related language. And we considered, we were really interested in kids who even given this, you know, intervention we thought would work, what would happen to slow responders, right? So if you were still not progressing very rapidly, what could we do to try to boost your outcome? So if you began with just the behavioral treatment and you were developing slowly, we could add more sessions. So the study was two sessions a week, but if you were a slow responder, we would intensify by um, increasing intervention by three times a week. If you started with the behavioral treatment and you were a slow responder, you could also maybe get the augmentative device. So we randomized you to either intensify or get the augmentative device. But if you began with the augmentative device, we didn't take that away from you. We would just intensify. Um, but then if you were a fast responder, then you would just stay the course in the intervention you started with. So here's the design, which is very busy, as you can see. Um, so we would begin with, um, let's see if I can get my air up. We would screen. We would do entry assessment. We would do the initial randomization. And this was a pilot study, so it was only about 63 kids. And then you either got the augmentative um, device or you did not. After three months, which we thought was a reasonable uh, amount of time, so 24 sessions, we would decide if you were a fast or a slow responder. And so we did a lot of assessments here. We had no idea how we were going to determine response, so we had 14 different variables that we tested from um, seven different tests way too many, um, but we were trying to figure out if we could determine a child who made 25% progress over baseline by this period of time. Um, and then, in the, then, if you were a fast responder, you stayed the course. If you were a slower responder, you got randomized to either increase intensity or get the device if you, were not, if you did not have the device in the beginning. If you did have the device, we could intensify. You can see that we're concerned here about these assessments and um, the early response phase. And the contrast here in terms of trying to figure out what the sequence is, we were interested in what should we start with? Should we start with the augmentative device or should we wait and see how the child responds and then add it in? And so the contrast here is really with what is your initial treatment? Where do you begin? So with the device or without? And the results were that um, spontaneous communicative utterances are main outcomes, um, either spoken or with the augmentative device, was a main effect of that first stage treatment. Um, we re so we re-randomized them if they were slow three months into treatment. Um, and at that point, we also brought in the parent. So there was parent training um, involved, and then we had this follow-up period at three months. So we're looking at that main effect. And what we found, which I think was a little surprising to us, was that actually the augmentative device really made a big difference for children's use of spoken language. Yes, they used the augmentative device some. About 10% of their utterances were also just augmented, but the majority of, of their communicative utterances were spoken. And so it benefited children if they got the device right from the beginning. And you can see here that we have, um, this is the first phase, this is the second phase, and this is the follow-up phase. And you can see that it drops a little bit. This is the group with the augmentative device. Drops a little bit over follow-up in part because not all the kids left with the augmentative device. Um, and the, the other group, the behavior group, is making slow and steady progress, but it's much faster with the augmentative device. We also found that children who got the augmentative device also had more novel words, and they also used more joint attention language by commenting. So the augmentative device was um, a benefit for all of those outcomes that we were looking at. 
So what we learned then was that that augmentative device really did help children to talk. It was an additional support. And so we would um, want to add that to the next study that we might do for all children. Um, there were significant gains right at midpoint, so after three months. So that determined the next study's early response timing. So to answer the question of how long do you wait until you should expect a response. And we also um, learned that slow response measures should just be one measure, that we were doing way too many assessments. Um, it, those, but those multiple measures really helped identify a single critical measure. And so um, we now use the CGI, which is a, a clinically uh, guided um, you know, uh, measure, so it's just a rating form that's done by the interventionist. It's not a research measure, it's an intervention measure, and that they, the interventionist can actually measure how this child is responding to the intervention. Um, we also knew that that 25 percent increase was um, not stringent enough because 70 percent of our kids were responders in that first study, so we needed to be a little bit more stringent. So all good information from doing this pilot. So the issues that we have to think about when you're trying to develop one of these adaptive treatment designs, in this case, a SMART design. A SMART stands for Sequential Multiple Assignment Randomized Trial. Um, so meaning that there are two different points of randomization based on the child's response. So we have to think about, well, what are our treatment options? What are our decision points? At what point do we decide that we can make a determination of response? What are the variables we're going to use to actually tailor or change the intervention? And what are those rules about uh, tailoring, um, both input and output treatment options at each decision point? So we have um, just finished another SMART study based on that first pilot. This study is funded by the National Institutes of Health. It's across, um, what, three, four different, three different sites? I think three different sites, uh, Rochester and New York and California. And we chose two initial treatments based on that first study. These are both evidence-based to improve language outcomes. So one of them is discrete trial training, and I'll give you my reasoning for that one. Um, and also the same JASPER EMT. Oops, I forgot Vanderbilt. I knew there were four sites. Okay. Um, so DTT because some children would be benefit from kind of a well-implemented DTT because a lot of the kids had had previous experience with this particular approach. So we wanted to make sure that we were focusing in on those core areas of um, of development, sort of communication and language, imitation and play, but using this approach of discrete trial training um, versus a much more naturalistic model, which is the JASPER EMT model, um, because we found that that worked in the last SMART. All of the children were given access to some communication system, so the picture exchange system, but on a tablet, um, because DTT typically involves kind of a picture-based um, uh, approach. And then we use the speech generating device for the JASP EMT group, um, now an iPad or a tablet with ProloQuote to go software. So this design looks like this. So we are um, screening children um, so that they meet the language requirements and um, cognitive requirements for this study. We would do our entry assessments. They would get randomized to either what we call core discrete trial training or the JASPER EMT. We decided that we wanted to see them more intensely every day, so we saw them every day in their classrooms at school. And again, about 20 to 24 sessions we um, believed was going to be the, make the difference in terms of knowing if they're a slow responder or a fast responder. You can see, let's see here. So this is the point of early response. And again, early response was done by the interventionist using the um, CGI. So they just rated whether the, what the severity of the child's problem was in the beginning, what, um, what gains or improvements they had made. 
in this six-week period and the severity level at that point in time. And so based on our criteria, we decided you're fast um, or slow. We also did um, randomized checks with the PIs to figure out if we all agreed on those CGI ratings, and we did. Um, okay, so after we determined your response, let's say that you're an early responder. So now we want to give you parent training because perhaps parent training is going to boost your outcomes, or we're going to just continue stay the course because maybe just more time is all you need in this treatment because you're already responding. So those were our two randomized options. Um, here we go. But let's say that you um, were a slow responder. At this point, we're interested in trying to put you on a positive trajectory. Now, it's possible um, that what we can do is to combine all of these different components from DTT and from Jasper and from EMT together um, in a uh, systematic way to boost your trajectory. So we called it a rescue protocol. That's just the name of it, but it's really uh, a combined approach. Or we could just keep you going um, in the same direction with the same treatment you were assigned to initially because maybe what you really need is just more time. So those are our questions, right? Do we need to change something about the intervention or do we just need to keep in this intervention for more time? And what we're comparing, again, is that sequence. Do we start in the beginning with the DTT and it doesn't matter what comes after that? Um, or do we start with JASP EMT? So we can, we can look at that sequence all together. We can also, because in this study we have 192 children, so now we have enough children that we can pretty carefully look at the adaptive treatment. So what happens if you um, start one and, and you're a slow responder and then you intensify? Is that better than if you start and you get the combination? So we can start to look at all of those different uh, variations. All right. So imagine a different problem from this. Um, so children are fully included in school, but they need help in making friends or learning social skills. So we know a lot from traditional randomized controlled trials. They've given us very specific information about what kinds of intervention components seem to be successful for helping children to improve in these areas. So for example, we studied um, one in which we looked at whether or not we could change how connected kids were in, uh, with their peers in their classrooms. And we found in one study that if we brought in peers to work with the child with autism, that that made a bigger difference than if we worked um, as an adult researcher with that child on their particular issues around peer interaction. So peer-assisted was more effective. We've also uh, learned that if we change the environment at school, so we train the playground aides, um, so we teach them some strategies on how to engage children um, and how to make sure that uh, kids are connected with one another, that those kids look better on the playground when blinded observers go out and watch them, right? So again, it's peer-mediated, but we have, what we're doing is we're changing something about the environment. So um, one of our outcome measures are these social network maps. So we're interested in whether or not we can connect kids to one another more in their classroom. So this is just an example from some of our studies um, where Sam in red is a child with autism who's connected to Ella, and um, he's what we would call peripheral, right? So he's not very well connected to the rest of the class, but he is connected to someone. He's not isolated. We have two other little boys who are isolated who don't have autism. So you'll see down in the blue letters, uh, Nicholas and Nolan are isolated. Um, and these numbers here tell us how connected that group is or how salient, how popular. Um, and these numbers tell us how many kids in the class nominated this group together. All right. So that's one of our outcome measures. 
So what we learned from a, a number of different randomized control trials, both from our work and from other folks' work, um, was that six to eight weeks was long enough to get change um, using either peer-mediated or paraprofessional implemented interventions. Um, sometimes, depending on the study, we got change on those social network maps. Um, but actually the findings have generally been stronger for those playground observations that we do. So looking at how kids are engaged with each other um, on the playground. So in the SMART that I'm going to talk about next, we use peer engagement as um, our primary outcome. And so here's another SMART, which is a little crazy. Um, and this, again, is a pilot SMART. And so I want to talk about this because sometimes you're not really sure um, how to proceed. So it's important to test these things out if you have that opportunity. So in the first um, set of randomization, so these are all children who are fully included in their general ed classroom. So they tend to be verbal children with autism in elementary school. So these are kindergarten through fifth or sixth graders. So the first thing we would do is we want to change something about the environment. So we're going to um, either randomize the child to get remaking recess, which is uh, the playground intervention that we teach the playground aides how to engage kids or we're going to extend that to classroom support. So we're also going to give the teacher some strategies for how to connect kids in the classroom. So in this set of this first randomization, we're going to change something about the environment. And then after um, the first phase, which is, mm, I think, what, eight, eight weeks, we are going to um, add in a new component. So we believe that all the kids would benefit from having a peer-mediated intervention or a parent-mediated medi intervention. Peer-mediated is one we've tested before where we just choose a couple of peers, two to three peers from the classroom, and we teach them how to engage all kids on the playground. Uh, we don't talk specifically about the child with autism, that's our target child, but just in general, general what are some strategies to use on the playground? The parent mediated was going to the home and uh, teaching the parent how to engage their child in a successful play date. So all the kids in both of these first conditions could get randomized to peer mediated or parent mediated intervention. And then the final uh, phase was where we would test responder status. So if you're an early responder, you just stay the course with whatever you were originally um, randomized to. But if you are a slow responder, we would do the combination of um, the combination of peer plus parent, um, or we would just give you more time in that same intervention. So again, kind of a timing question. Um, because one of the things that we struggle with, I think, in thinking about inclusion and how to support kids in general on peer interactions is how much we need to do. And given that it can get very expensive to add in all of these different interventions, you want to understand for whom uh, the intervention works best for at which, uh, at which phase. So not all kids need all of these different components. Okay, so the main issues that we tried to consider in this pilot SMART was would the teachers and the non-professional staff, so our paraprofessionals, would they even agree to these intervention modules initially? And, and then once we um, in, implemented them, would they change if the child wasn't responding? Um, and then would we agree on response non-response. So would parents agree? Would teachers agree? Would the research staff agree on who's responding and who's not? Would parents agree to the home intervention versus school versus both? Okay, these are critical issues if you want to actually have these interventions work uh, in a community setting. And then we thought it was really important to identify a school champion at the school and would that make a difference in treatment adherence and buy-in and kind of the sustainability of this intervention. Um, and then 
sort of generally we wanted to know what would be the rate of response, non-response on these components. Now we've just um, completed this, and it's not a very large study, so again, we're just testing out these implementation uh, questions. So I want to conclude then with just talking about SMARTs in general in that they have a lot of promise in intervention research. They can help us think about making meaningful changes for individuals in the face of these non-response situations. A lot of times we just aren't sure what to do when a child doesn't respond to what we think is an evidence-based intervention. They can also help us think about systematizing clinical practice so we can understand for whom um, this intervention sequence works best for. So some children might need, you know, let's say discrete trial training first and then go into something more naturalistic. On the other hand, there can be children who would benefit more from doing something right from the beginning, naturalistically or with peers, uh, than one-on-one. -on -one. So it helps us to think about how we're going to sequence um, intervention for children. And it gets us a little bit closer to personalizing these interventions. So in summary, I think the last decade has really witnessed a huge increase in more rigorous design testing interventions. We have comparative efficacy studies. We have tests of active ingredients. Not many, but a few. Um, and we're starting to see some of these adaptive treatment designs, such as the SMART design. We now have lots of effective treatment components to choose from in constructing a comprehensive treatment program. So I think as we start to think about what a child needs, we can build that comprehensive program from these effective model, uh, modules, knowing what will benefit a particular child. And future research will likely test these sequences of intervention components that really help us understand what's working when and for whom. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge uh, our funding, which I skipped through there very quickly, our funding sources and people in my lab that go into schools and do some of this work, um, which is, I don't know why it's going so slowly. Um, and if you want more information, you can uh, check out the airbnetwork.org, which is a collection of people across the country who are doing work in some of these different areas and then also on our own uh, lab website. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kasari. Um, we have time for some questions. We do have quite a few, so I'm going to try to get through them. But if your question is not asked, please just email me. You all have my email. So if you email your question, I will forward it on. Um, okay. So earlier on, um, we were looking at the, um, the results from the JASPER trial, and we had a question as to why the waitlist group showed improvement as well as the group that received JASPER. The waitlist group showed improvement. Did they? A slight uh, improvement at the end. Well, I think, I, think. Uh, I don't remember which one. So usually the waitlist group is staying fairly flat. Um, it's not improving on the outcome measure that we have chosen, I think in the ones that I showed. But of course, children are improving over time, regardless of what you do, for the most part, because um, there's maturation and because they are getting interventions. So I think if you're thinking about an experimental approach, that experimental approach has to be pretty potent to rise above whatever that background intervention is. And so I think in the JASPER ones that the joint engagement was greater for the uh, kids receiving JASPER than it was for kids who are waiting uh, to get it. But it's not that it stays at zero, right? They're still improving some, but it's, but it's significantly different between the groups. So I guess I, I'm not sure because that's, that's not what I recall from the slide. Okay. Um, another question was, is, is JASPER being made available 
um, more generally, and is there any plan to make it more available? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's in a lot of different places, but, but, you know, people have to be trained in it. It's like any of these complicated interventions. They often tend to be too complicated, and uh, we require training. Um, that's true of most of the naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. It's also true of DTT, but I think the involvement of training is, is greater for some of these naturalistic methods. So there are schools that use it. There are places, different countries, um, w that we've been to that are using the method. So I hope it, it's getting used more for those kids who would benefit from it. Um. Another question we had was, what communication and social assessments did you use for your entry assessments? Uh, I think one all the details about, so I was going quickly through methods. Um, so entry assessments for us with little kids are almost always the early social communication scales and the structured play assessment. So we look at uh, social communication, we look at play, we do the Mullen, we do a mother-child interaction. Um, we sometimes do some other measures. When we work with um, teachers, we use the um, SPACE, which is kind of a shorter version of the ESCS and the SPA that Stephanie Shire developed. Um, so we're, we take a lot of um, assessments in the beginning because that's how we uh, determine our targets for JASPER. It's also what we do with um, children on the playground, right? We're going to do a number of assessments, observations. We'll do the social network. We ask children about their friends, so ask kids themselves. So we gather all that information before we start so we know what targets um, should be. Another question was, how individualized were each of the specific treatment types delivered during the study? For example, does each child receive the same formula of JE, or is it adapted for each individual child based on their development and needs and what skills they already have, or does each child in the study receive an identical version? Yeah, I don't think um, identical is good for anyone, right, because you have to... So whatever the child brings to the session, you have to respect. So if a child is um, playing at a level of play that's, you know, uh, just combining objects, I'm not going to work on symbolic play with that child because they're not ready for that. So it is individualized, but it's within this um, framework of the intervention. So we figure out where they are, and then we try to move them along developmentally. Um, and you can do that with young kids because you're trying to fill in those gaps. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and another one was, did you consider using um, the BOSCC as an outcome measure? Had I considered using the BSCC? B-O-S-C-C? -C? Oh, the BOSC. Yeah, uh -huh. the BOSC. You know, we have, um, so in the, let's see, in the second SMART on minimally verbal kids, we're using the BOSC, yes. Uh, but we, you know, we just completed, I don't even know if we've completed all of the follow-ups yet, so uh, that'll be a little while before that's out. Can you also specify the number of hours of intervention per week for the AIM ASD design for both the DTT and the Jasper. Yeah, so um, four, I think we went with four hours per week. So, an, um, is that right? An hour, uh, about an hour per day. So, um, you know, we have this little range, I think between 20 and 24 sessions for that phase one. And then again, it can, um, the same in the second phase for that that particular one. Um, so would you very much? Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's it's sorry. not it's not very much, but it is it's fairly intense in a sense, but it's it's certainly not uh, 20 hours per week. Thanks. Um, would you comment on what your understanding has been from these intervention studies on children from minority backgrounds or culturally and linguistic di different backgrounds? I assume 
Yeah, that's a great question. They were part of the samples, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So because I'm in Los Angeles and I'm in the Los Angeles Unified School District, almost all my samples are, I would say, the last one, you know, 86%, 75% minority because the school district itself is about 75% uh, Hispanic and only about 9% white although a little higher for our kids with autism in the public schools in terms of white. Um, but still, very, uh, very diverse populations. And because we go out into the schools, we get these diverse populations, which means we go into diverse homes, which means that we would deliver an intervention in the language that the parent uh, uses in the home. So the samples tend to be um, very diverse, and we do think about the cultural implications of what we're doing, and things are adapted, I guess, or adjusted a little bit depending on, uh, you know, what we need to do to deliver that intervention in a culturally sensitive way. Um, does age of the child determine um, the sequence of the intervention at all? Um, I think those are empirical questions. So we have kind of a, a narrow range of most of my studies. So it's not a, a very wide range. So, you know, five to eight uh, versus, um, you know, preschoolers would be like, you know, sometimes they're just two to three-year-olds. Um, so we always look at age. Um, age might be a factor in those five to eight-year-old kiddos. I don't know that yet. It didn't really turn out in the pilot study, but again, it was a smaller study. So I think age is always something to consider. Is there any plan to um, try these kinds of interventions in older children or adolescents? Um, I do think that the uh, augmentative, you know, using augmentative devices with older children. So we are completing a study with 6 to 11-year-olds. You know, it changes a little bit in terms of play and toys and things like that. Um, but if they're language learning children, I think some of the same strategies can be used. You just want to make sure that you're, uh, you know, relevant in terms of their interests and functionality. And then in terms of the peer interactions, we have done a little bit of work with middle schoolers and high schoolers, um, but not, not as much as I would like to have done. For the parent and peer coaching, how long do you spend um, coaching both these groups? And what kind of coaching does that involve? Is it one-on-one -on -one or in groups? Yeah, so peers are um, usually just the the neurotypical peers from the classroom, so it's two or three, and, and because you're in a school setting and you're working up against the clock in terms of all of the things kids have, we're talking 20 minutes twice a week. So really a low dose. In fact, the remaking recess intervention was based on six weeks, um, or eight, six or eight weeks of intervention, so not very much, a very low dose intervention. And I think that those are particular questions you can ask. You know, what can you do? Do you get some effect in a low dose in a, in a quick turnaround? And that gives you information about what the potential of an intervention is. You know, it's clear that kids need uh, longer term interventions, more comprehensive interventions. So the kind of work I do is really thinking about the components that are going to be useful as you build something out. Um, but it's not, um, it's, I don't do all of the things that a child's going to need. So there are multiple things. Great. Um, I'm afraid that that's all that we have time for today. If your question didn't get asked, then please email me, and I will forward it on to um, Professor Kasari. Um, a complete replay of the presentation will be available on the Spectrum News site in a couple of days. This webinar is part of an ongoing series, so please check out our site for upcoming talks to be announced soon and video archives of previous webinars. Our next webinar is in November with Brian Scassoletti, and that's on robots and autism research. Okay, and thank you again, Professor Kasari, and thank you all for tuning in.